Our memories define who we are. Memories are the glue that holds our mental life together. However, memories are not formed instantaneously. Instead, new memories are gradually transformed from an initially labile state to a more permanent state. But even that permanent state is not necessarily permanent, since I think we've all at some point witnessed a bit of memory loss. But understanding the retaining, reconstructing and retrieving of information that underpins the process of memory formation is of great interest and importance because it could be used to help understand better different neurodegenerative diseases and potential therapeutics. It could also be used to maybe someday edit memories as seen in a lot of pop culture or to even enhance memory formation. But to do any of this, an understanding of where memories are stored and how memories are stored is required. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video we're going to talk about memory formation and in particular understanding recent and remote memory formation. And then we'll look at this recent nature publication that shows the importance of astrocytes in the development of forming remote memories. So recent and remote memories are just alternative ways of saying short-term and long-term memory. And the really fascinating thing is that the organisation of recent and remote memories changes as the memory becomes more mature. A simplified overview of this process is that recent memories depend initially on the medial temporal lobe that includes the hippocampus. And then remote memories instead depend more on other brain regions, in particular the cortex. And so the really interesting question is how new memories that form in the hippocampus are actually transformed into remote memories in the cortical networks. So if we take a look at this figure from a review article, this provides a leading hypothesis for the fact that over time, the role of the hippocampus becomes less important and instead the cortical modules are more important for remote memory. However, the temporal separation between these events is still unclear and it could be different for different memories and for you know different strengths of those memories and this is further supported by the fact that the hippocampus also seems to be important for retrieval of rem what we would consider to be remote memories. On the flip side there is also some controversy in the literature about the importance of the cortical regions during the acquisition phase of recent memory. So why is there controversy? Well, that's because studying these questions is actually really technically challenging. However, there are now lots of different chemogenetic and optogenetic tools that enable researchers to have real-time reversible manipulation of different pathways or different receptors in specific cells that they're trying to study. And then these tools can be applied to mouse models whereby they can succumb these mice to different situations to test their recent and remote memory. For example, one behavioural model is contextual fear conditioning, which is where the mice learn an association between a distinctive place and an aversive event, such as a shock. And so when that mouse is placed back into the same context, the mice show a range of conditioned fear responses, including freezing. And this is because I guess they are somewhat expecting that there's going to be a shock. So it's a form of Pavlovian conditioning. And so the reason I gave this particular example is because it's the same way that the researchers in this recent nature paper used to understand how astrocytes are playing a role in the formation of recent and remote memories. So astrocytes are another type of cell found in the brain along with neurons and the function of astrocytes just seems to keep expanding but their main roles seem to be to sense and modify neuronal activity. But interestingly the number of astrocytes within the human brain actually outnumbers the number of neurons. However until only recently have astrocytes been started to be investigated in terms of its role in memory function. For example a recent study activated the GQ signaling pathway in astrocytes within the CA1 region of the hippocampus. When the activation of the astrocytes coincided with the acquisition phase of memory formation, it was shown to enhance recent memory 
emphasizing the importance of astrocytes in memory process. So in this recent study, they were further interested in exploring the role of astrocytes in memory formation, but this time, instead of activating the GQ pathway, they activated the GI signaling pathway. So the way that they activated the GI pathway in CA1 astrocytes was by using the cyanoreceptor exclusively activated by the cyanodrugs, which only activates the pathway when the mice are injected with clozapine and oxide. This enables temporal control over when this pathway is activated within the astrocytes. So the authors timed this activation with the delivery of fear conditioning training when the mice were paired with a foot shock and a novel context and also an auditory cue. This aversive event usually has the result of making the mice freeze when they're placed back into the same context a day later. So what happened when the GI pathway was activated in the astrocytes? Well, it turned out that these mice also froze when they were placed in the same context the next day. So that seemed to suggest that recent memory was not implicated in any way. However, what they found was 20 days later, when the mice were placed back into that same context, the freezing was reduced. This meant it seemed like they had forgotten the aversive event that had happened, which suggests that there'd been some disruption to the formation of remote memory. For example, the deficiency was still observed 45 days after that. However, whilst GI activation in the CA1 astrocytes during the acquisition of spatial memory selectively impaired the remote memory, but not the recent memory recall, direct neuronal inhibition of CA1 neurons affected both the recent and remote memory. So this seemed to suggest that the astrocytes potentially were providing an element of specificity over disrupting only remote memory formation. The question was, what? So as we mentioned earlier, the formation of remote memory seems to depend heavily on neuronal connections between the hippocampus and the cortex. So it was interesting to note that GI activation of astrocytes during the acquisition phase resulted in the prevention of the recruitment of the anterior cingulate cortex during memory acquisition. So exploring this further and summarising the author's results in a very brief manner, what they found was that a population of the CA1 neurons project to the ACC and it was these particular neurons that seem to be modulated by the CA1 astrocytes. This seems to show that the CA1 astrocytes provide projection-specific modulation of remote memory. So these results really emphasise the importance of studying non-neuronal cells in memory formation. And it also raises some interesting questions. For example, how is the specificity achieved by which the astrocytes only target the CA1 neurons projecting to the ACC? Secondly, how common is this offence? Is it only seen in certain types of memory formation? Another thing I didn't mention was that during the fear conditioning training, when a foot shock was paired with a novel context and an auditory cue, the mice were shown to have a loss of remote memory in terms of the loss of freezing when placed back into that same context. However, just by playing the same auditory cue, it didn't see any loss of remote memory. So the auditory memory wasn't lost, it was the context, the contextual memory that was lost. And so this is another interesting thing to take from the study. And so the results suggest that there needs to be an update to the current models of our understanding of recent and remote memory. For example, this figure I showed earlier is definitely a bit out of date since it has a neuron-centric model. And so now it seems clear that the astrocytes are also playing a role. Another thing that's interesting is I mentioned in a previous video that the astrocytes in the hippocampus can become senescent and this is something that's seen in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And so one of the questions in this was what was the impact of having senescent astrocytes? And so by having senescent astrocytes, it now seems clear that it can definitely have an impact on altering memory formation, which could go hand in hand with the symptoms seen in Alzheimer's disease patients. And so I'm just speculating here, but I think the puzzle pieces, I guess, are beginning to be put together. And I think with all these new genetic and chemo-optogenetic tools available to study different and specific regions of the brain, I think some exciting research should be coming out soon. So overall, I thought this was a really interesting paper. 
And I think I've now understand the brain that little bit better. And hopefully you do too, because as always, I hope you've learned something and thanks for listening.